Welcome to a discussion of the book, Nature, Economy, and Equity, Sacred Water, Profane Markets. By Mason Gaffney, Ph.D. And published as the November 2016 issue of the American Journal of Economics and Sociology. My name is Edward Dodson. I am director of the online education and research project, the School of Cooperative Individualism. Professor Gaffney's contributions to economic theory and public policy are explored in this book, Rent Unmasked. How to Save the Global Economy and Build a Sustainable Future, published in 2017 and edited by British economist and author Fred Harrison. An emeritus professor of economics at the University of California, Mason Gaffney has for decades been one of the world's foremost experts on the economic and environmental impact of the legal rights granted to individuals and entities over the one source absolutely essential to human life, water. Nature, Economy and Equity, Sacred Water, Profane Markets provides a unique historical and analytical insight into the struggles over water rights in California going back centuries, intensified by the competition for water between urban, agricultural, and other interests. As Professor Gaffney observes, Too often in today's world, ordinary people must survive by engaging in practices that are environmentally and socially harmful, practices they personally detest. The object of policy should be to remove the perverse incentives that encourage war production, overfishing, destructive logging or farming, chemical pollution, and similar activities. Having examined the evidence compiled by Professor Gaffney, we must ask ourselves whether the problem is one of ignorance of the facts or the denial of those facts for reasons of short-term self-interest. Take our approach to how we deal with the sewage we generate. Over 80% of the sewage of large cities in the developing world is poured untreated into nearby bodies of water. That same water is then used by downstream farmers to irrigate fields, thereby contaminating vegetables. This statistic and others presented by Professor Gaffney suggest that despite all of the technical advances made in our systems of production, the environmental state of the planet is rapidly worsening. Solving the problems will not be easy and some will be more adversely impacted than others. A comprehensive plan to protect nature from the depredations of the current owners requires a strategy that will be disruptive. Elites in business, government, think tanks, law firms, universities, and other institutions are reluctant to change any of the rules that govern the current operating system for planet Earth. All around the globe, there are many individuals, groups, and well-funded organizations that have taken on the mission of solving the world's environmental problems. Professor Gaffney concludes that many conservation groups, think tanks, NGOs, lawyers, and economists exhibit elitist attitudes regarding decisions over management of nature that stand in the way of real solutions. Some national conservation and environmental groups support policies that are directly tied to the programs of corporate allies. Others are more concerned about the public interest. Nevertheless, they are still devoted to goals that avoid questioning the system that concentrates political and economic power.
Professor Gaffney concludes that the preservation of our planet's life-giving capacities requires us to treat the planet as much more than areas of sovereign control or as the substance of our claims to property. No affiliation with a religion is required to believe that all of life is sacred and due respect and reverence. Treating nature as a sacred gift means treating it wisely, with our full capacity to imagine ways to heal the split between humans and the earth. Systemic change involves many facets of our socio-political arrangements and institutions. Our systems of property law and taxation have very direct effects on behavior. Politics, Professor Gaffney observes, dictates economic outcomes. If we are going to make a serious effort to live in harmony with nature, we also need an economic system that enables people to live in harmony with each other. As we look around the world, what we see is a consistent pattern of concentrated control over all that is essential to life. Thus, for a large percentage of the Earth's population, day-to-day -day survival is the challenge. Concern for the future is the cost. There is a fundamental injustice at work when some have so much that others have almost nothing. Under current rules, each child is born into a world in which the earth has been fully appropriated by past inhabitants and passed on to descendants. Professor Gaffney in just a few words explains much about the human condition, the reason why so few have so much and so many have so little. Setting prices on the gifts of nature, in contrast to political management of them, can exert constant pressure against oligopoly by requiring every interest group to compete on the same basis without any special favors for insiders. But that is only true for prices that incorporate the public equity in nature. Of course, the follow-up question is how prices for access to natural resources ought to be set. What is fair and just? Professor Gaffney offers the recent example of Bolivia to make an important point. In Bolivia, in the year 2005, the Andean term Pacamama, Mother Earth, was introduced into water politics as a way of invoking the sacred. Yet after the water wars were over and the corporations abandoned the project, the claim that water is sacred provided little practical guidance to municipal water managers. Does it mean that governments have a sacred duty to supply at zero cost as much water as citizens demand through a complex network of pipes of human construction? There remain many places around the globe where nature is still held as a commons. The members of such communities can and do make decisions about the allocation and exploitation of natural resources that benefit the entire community. However, circumstances do change over time. In the case of a village well or a village managed forest, the simple rules of a commons can be applied without great difficulty. Prices are unnecessary under those conditions. At some point, scale is a problem that requires new tools, with or without the involvement of for-profit corporations. Beyond the village, the existence of citizen participation in important public policy decisions is not only difficult, but in many parts of the world not tolerated. Market forces might work to solve problems of resource allocation and use, but politics everywhere intervenes to dictate economic outcomes, often to the benefit of privileged interests. 
Professor Gaffney sees this dynamic at work in the politics of water. The process of acquiring water rights in the guise of gaining control of land threatens a large part of the African continent with devastation. Whereas critics blame the market forces of capitalism for the displacement of small-scale farmers, the processes occur through political channels, not through impersonal exchange. If there is a market functioning in these situations, it is the market for political power. Which brings the discussion back to the issue of how those who hold the power over allocation to natural resources can be held accountable to the public interest. Professor Gaffney provides best practices that will yield the appropriate level of equality of opportunity. Taxes on the ownership of natural resources or charges for withdrawals for private use can equalize economic conditions and reduce the power of owners who acquired their rights through political connections or inheritance. Historically, monopoly ownership thrives in a system in which nature is held without reciprocal payments of fees. Professor Gaffney's observation has been made by a long line of thoughtful analysts over several centuries, yet in only a very few countries has the power of monopolistic privilege and inherited wealth been effectively diminished. This particular type of landed privilege is deeply entrenched in those parts of the United States where periods of water scarcity are frequent and prolonged. The privilege of prior appropriation was adopted in arid regions of the United States. During low rainfall years, the reduced flow is not shared among appropriators on a pro rata basis. Instead, a top senior rights holder has a 100% firm supply, followed by his next senior and so on. The most junior rights holder is likely to end up with no water that year. The result, as Professor Gaffney observes, is that water is denied to farmers who are the most productive. Even worse, the practice discourages water conservation even in a drought. Yet California does provide a very good example of sound water management, incorporated into law with the passage of the Wright Act of 1887. Sadly, many countries around the world have adopted laws similar to the worst elements of California law and ignored the best feature of California's experience. I am referring here to the Wright Act, Irrigation Districts. Democratic, self-governing bodies that produced a revolution in California farming from 1887 to World War II, and even to some extent thereafter. The policy of requiring water recipients to pay for water according to benefits received encouraged the efficient use of land and rapid economic development. The districts avoided the normal problem of concentrated ownership that normally accompanies economic growth. Towns and cities arose out of villages as local economies were sustained by the high value horticulture and farming that the land fees encouraged. What is needed, according to Professor Gaffney, is the right balance between infrastructure maintenance, regulatory intervention, and market pricing for water usage. Physical conditions, such as expanded use of groundwater for irrigation, are only part of the explanation for the dire circumstances faced in some regions. The failure to adopt an effective management regime is an even bigger factor in most cases. In the absence of pumping fees or other regulatory mechanism, each user has an incentive to pump water faster than other users, thereby causing system failure.
Another issue that involves rights to water is how to ensure a local population has access to clean water at an affordable cost when much of the water is being drawn away by external users. This chart indicates which of the countries on the African continent are most dependent on fresh water generated outside their borders. Mason Gaffney offers this comment regarding the situation in much of Africa with much broader implications. Putting a price on water and forcing foreign businesses to pay a fair price for it would immediately stop the wholesale theft of Africa's water and the related destruction of its watersheds. Professor Gaffney also observes that the cost of water also determines to some extent what crops are grown or animals raised by farmers. When a farmer is encouraged to apply water lavishly on land, there is a tendency to grow low value crops that are mostly used to feed cattle, pasture and hay. If water is applied sparingly, farmers employ more capital and labor and grow high value crops, such as fruits and vegetables. Water is such a potent substitute for labor and capital that more water often means lower yields from each acre. The productivity of water is measured not in higher yields, but in lower labor and capital costs that raise net rents in spite of lower yields. The above observation should be readily apparent to anyone. Arid land will produce low yields without irrigation. If the cost of bringing water to the land is minimal, but the potential yields are much higher, so will the potential annual rental value of the irrigated land. The right public response is to capture this increase in value that public sector spending has caused. Summarizing the conventional wisdom held by many economists, Professor Gaffney argues that the solution most widely embraced has readily apparent negative consequences. The World Bank and conventionally trained economists have argued that the rights of small-scale farmers can best be protected by establishing clear land titles and allowing markets to work. The cure of privatization can be worse than the illness. The control of water is a source of economic and political power everywhere in the world. For that reason, the allocation of water follows the course of power. The use of water is subject to waste, hoarding, and legal battles because the rules that govern its use are also the basis upon which fortunes can be made in the land to which water is often attached. Professor Gaffney goes on to observe that without access to affordable credit, land that is initially distributed to small-scale farmers ends up in the hands of a few. And of course, the same thing happens to water rights. That, it seems to me, to be an apt description of the situation as it has existed for centuries. At a time when individual nations are drawing back from cooperation with one another in defense of perceived sovereign interests, we desperately need enforceable international law that prevents monopolization of the water we all must have access to in order to survive. Professor Gaffney also points to the broad economic inefficiencies that occur when water is underpriced and wasted. Inefficient water allocations not only affect the locations of water use, but also the amount of labor productivity employed. Wasted water also means squandered opportunities to employ more labor. In areas of chronic underemployment, this is a major factor.
common sense supports his assessment, not only would an increase in the number of smaller farms provide employment opportunities for people living in rural areas, but smaller farms would provide an economic base for the support of rural towns and the availability of needed public services, such as schools and hospitals. Professor Gaffney also has strong criticism for the manner in which major dam projects are funded. Despite numerous protests by environmental organizations and citizen groups against the construction of large-scale dams, there are still 160 to 320 new dams being built every year around the world. Since large dams are seldom financed by the beneficiaries, construction of those projects offers a vast scope for corruption. There is much more to commend this recent book by Professor Gaffney. A much longer treatment is needed, and the book deserves serious discussion and debate by policymakers, environmentalists, economists, and the general public. A few closing comments by Professor Gaffney point to what is needed if we are ever to move beyond the status quo. In closing, I would observe that the problems we face today, both economically and environmentally, are a direct result of the constraints imposed on practical people by the theoretical principles that have influenced decisions about how to treat nature. The theories and ideas that have the effect of stifling consideration of equity do not announce themselves as such. Professors seldom point out the ways in which seemingly neutral concepts found in textbooks are laden with values that deny the majority of people on earth an equal chance. And so, Professor Gaffney has provided us with the insights he has acquired over a lifelong study of how the world actually works. He warns us to question theories and policies that ignore the constructive impact of land rent taxation and market water pricing on the production and just distribution of wealth in any society. Thank you.